welcome back to the DCU Classics Director's Commentary with your host, me, Scott Toyguru Nightlick on the Spectre Creative Channel. This was a, uh, well, it was an important wave for me, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but for collectors and fans, this was an important wave, especially if you were fans of the Justice Society. He hadn't done too many Justice Society. So this filled out the ranks with a lot of characters, like the uh, Golden Age Adam, not to be confused with the other Adam characters, Sandman, also from the Golden Age, modern character Magog, uh, or, well, semi-modern, Stargirl, one of the uh, also newer characters, the Golden Age version of Hawkman, who had a feature that was a first for the brand, Lord Naga, a.k.a. Uh, King Cobra, and then, of course, still one of my absolute favorite Build-A-Figures from the line was Stripe. Because if you do Stargirl, you pretty much are obligated to do Stripe because they go hand-in-hand, hand, stepfather and daughter. And, you know, it's a guy in a giant mech suit. Come on, you can't go bad with a guy in a giant mech suit, right? All right, so why this line, or I'm sorry, this wave was special for me is this was the end of the line. This was it. This was the last wave for retail that I worked on. I was... Uh, off to work on new assignments. I was still at Mattel, and I would be at Mattel for quite a few years after this, but I was shifted off to work on some other brands and other projects, some of which I can talk about, some of which I can't. But uh, after this, the last two waves were going to be worked on by a new brand management team, so while I wasn't hands-on with them, I did get to oversee from a distance. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, the good and the bad of all the waves, including some things that weren't released specifically in DCU Classic waves, like the uh, Batman wave that included Catman here, which was, you know, basically completely compatible with DCU Classics. So I did manage to collect them while I was at Mattel, but I didn't work on these directly. Uh, I might do kind of like a catch-all video just sort of reviewing the last two waves of DCU Classics, wave 20 and 21, and then some of those random Batman figures, um, as ones I didn't work on. All right, but as far as the last wave, I did work on. So wave 19. So the first figure that sort of uh, highlighted this wave was Hawkman. Not this version. This was the first Hawkman we did way back in wave 6. And while that was an awesome Hawkman figure, my personal favorite Hawkman was the one we did for the DC Super Friends line, which I probably should do a wave to this all in itself. Or I'm sorry, video about this, because... The Super Friends line was awesome, even if it was one of those kind of weird hodgepodge lines where it was a little kid line sold in the kind of big kid aisle. Moving back to Hawkman as a character to himself, he has had quite a few looks over the years. And going back to his, I guess, uh, roots, if you will, I mean, not all the way back to ancient Egypt, maybe, or Thanagar, but... He's had armored looks, he's had more bird-like looks, and for the purposes of this toy and one of his Golden Age incarnations, he's had more of, I guess you could say, a Mexican wrestler kind of look, at least as far as the way the mask was. And Mexican wrestlers were actually really popular at the time that DCU Classics came out. I don't know if that's why we chose this look, but we thought we'd pair it with the Golden Age, more kind of hawk look, where he actually had a beak. And what was great, this is the first, I almost want to say only figure in DCU Classics that had two different swappable heads. Uh, this was huge for Motu Classics. Motu, we did this all the time. And nowadays, in things like Marvel Legends, this is very commonplace, where a character will come with kind of a vintage head and a modern head, or, you know, a maskless head and a regular head, etc. But for DCU Classics, we just, I don't know, for one reason or another, we didn't really do this. So now you could choose to display your Mexican wrestler head or your uh, vintage Golden Age hawk head with the beak. And, of course, the suit uh, had your different colors. You lost the hawk logo on the chest, which you only had in modern times. So it was a cool new interpretation. And for the first time in the line came King Cobra. So a character we hadn't done before, unlike Hawkman, who had a figure and actually would have another one later on for the New 52. King Cobra, though, had a bit of a snag. While he does go back to DC Universe for quite a few decades, doing his name as King Cobra on package was going to be an issue. Names get used and reused a lot by comic book companies, and sometimes you get two different companies with characters with the same name. And there's lawsuits and settlements and all sorts of ways of dealing with that. In the toy industry, names get used 
And if after they're copyrighted, if they're not used again for something like three or four years, I forget the exact number of months, you lose the rights to that name. So for Mattel with Ninjor here, who is in the vintage Masters of the Universe line, well, that name was scooped up in the 90s by Power Rangers. So that name was no longer available, even though the character was still known as Ninjor. So in the case of the modern line, Masters of the Universe classics, we had to change the name to Ninja Warrior, because we couldn't use the name Ninja, Ninjor, excuse me. And one of the ways Hasbro actually attaches this is they call characters after Marvel. So this is Marvel's Rage, not just Rage. And I suppose that's something we could have done, like, you know, DC's King Cobra. Obviously, the reason we couldn't use the name Cobra on package is because there's a major toy line with Cobra as the bad guy. And, uh, you know, it wasn't something Mattel was going to trample on. So we just used basically his real name or his other name, which is Nornaga, and that became a way of solving the issue without, without uh, I guess, calling it DC's King Cobra, which, you know, in hindsight, that might have actually been a way to do it. It's very common now. But he came out really cool, and the horseman just, you know, nailed it and got to reuse you know, some arms with the scales from Aquaman with some new parts, and he came out great. Next up was the Atom, continuing our kind of wrestler, uh, wrestler, Mexican wrestler kind of theme with the Hawkman figure. I'm not kidding you. Kids love these kind of figures. Now, there's a lot of Atoms in the DC universe. Uh, there have been, you know, 80, and they've, well, they've gone back decades. There's even Captain Atom. Uh, some are related to others, some are not. This particular one was going to be the Adam, the uh, Pratt version from the Justice Society, moving forward with the whole Justice Society theme of this wave. And uh, it was great because he was also kind of back in the comics as Damage, I think is his, was his name at the time, uh, instead of the Adam. But, uh, you know, this was definitely going to be the, the core, the older version of him with the full... Mexican wrestler full face mask as opposed to the the one with the little fin on the head. Not that I'm not a fan of characters with fins on their heads, but that's a video for another time. It came out really great. Bright colors, appeals to kids, and helped fill out that Justice Society uh, look, that, or, you know, a team. So, uh, again, great. We love, you know, trying to complete teams. Big goal. Ah, Sandman. So here was one that I was really, really excited about. Well, and a big part is because of his look. Just like the Atom, there are multiple Sandman, Sandmen, Sandmans in DC, some of which we had access to and some we did not have access to, obviously. But as far as the Golden Age Sandman, that was someone we did, and I personally was really excited to get to this figure because I love his look. He's got a green suit. He's got a purple cape. He's got a fedora. And most importantly, he's got a gas mask. Because that's his weapon, his, his gas gun. Okay, so sort of secret single toy collecting behavior. I love characters in gas masks. I just think it's such a cool look. Uh, I love the whole 1930s, kind of, uh, you know, 1940s, uh, you know, sort of steampunk 2.0 look that, that this invokes. And again, you know, core member of the Justice Society going all the way back. So made sense to do him. And yeah, I just, I was really, really excited personally. He's still one of my favorite DCU Classics figures. It's also interesting that we never planned on a suit buck, meaning a generic body that wore a suit. Yet this one came up so much, we should have planned for it. Um, you know, creating a, a buck that could have been reused. It got used on so many characters. Luckily, there was a Clark Kent figure from the DC Superheroes line that had preceded DCU Classics. And we were able to use this buck, and it did get reused a lot. It would have been nice, I think, to create an original one for DCU Classics to update this a little, but because we had this one, it was at least a solution. And honestly, I was shocked at how much this got used overall. I mean, even all the way to Signature Series with figures like Ra's al Ghul, um, you know, it was just, it was amazing how much this buck came up. Not expected. So getting to use him again on Sandman, and... Man, those colors, the green and the purple and, and the gas mask face. I mean, I just love what the horsemen do. They are absolutely amazing. And, you know, like I said, I love gas mask figures. Probably why I like the first Hellboy movie so much. Even though this guy also, you know, had blades shooting out of his arms and stuff. But come on, put a gas mask on a figure. They're just awesome. Next up, we have our modern Magog figure, who's actually a character who comes from the Bible. Well, not him, but I mean the name. 
And he originally was part of the whole Kingdom Come storyline, but then got a new lease on life with the Justice Society Kingdom Come kind of follow-up, which is an amazing storyline if you haven't read it. Even have has uh, Alex Ross doing some of the art like he did for the original Kingdom Come. And while Magog has sometimes been a villain, he's also been a hero. It's kind of like, you know, what's, <laughs> what's his mood of the day, if you will? But uh, he was enjoying, you know, a resurgent, resurgence, resurgence, thank you, Scott, um, a resurgent of popularity, thanks to the Justice Society storyline. DC Direct had done a version of this figure in their line, but it was the older version of him from the original Kingdom Come when he was, uh, I guess, aged up. In this one, you know, he had much older face, you know, frowny and stuff, and, uh, I mean, still basic design, and also a little bit taller, because DC Direct figures were 7-inch in scale, which I'm actually going to get to in a moment. But our version was the younger, more version in, more version? Version in his prime, and, uh, you know, another way to, you know, sort of tie it into what was happening in the comics, without doing a whole wave like we did with the Lantern Wave. All right, wrapping it up, we have Courtney, Stargirl. Great figure. Got to use the teen buck, got to reuse the staff that came with the original Starman figure, but this time doing it in clear, powered-up plastic. Now, Stargirl has a very interesting history. So she's had quite a lot of appearances. Appearances? Appearances. Boy, I'm really getting tongue-tied today. My English is much more better. She's appeared in live action in the uh, DC TV series. Series is is is? Series is is. Sure, why not? And uh, But she's also been, become very popular in the comic book. Beyond her original appearance, she's kind of grown into her own, even starring in her own comic for a while. Although she is definitely linked with her stepfather, who drives around in that giant mech suit, which we'll get to when we talk about the Build-A-Figure in a moment. She's also notorious for being very teenage. She wears braces, although I think she had them removed in the Justice Society story uh, that I just referenced. And even though DC Direct has done figures of her, Again, scale. The DC Direct figures seem to be a little big, and they don't really work with the DCU classics. So it was great to do her not only in scale, but also smaller, because she is a teenager. So she used the Teenage Buck, which is smaller. We also used the Teenage Buck in Justice League Unlimited when we did her. We used the Supergirl body and actually had to redo the tool to remove the S-Shield so we could do her. And that was really cool. So braces and all, and shiny bright paint that was used to uh, do her deco to really make her stand out. She was a figure I sort of insisted in getting in the line for one reason, is that I wanted to thank Jeff Johns, who was a huge supporter of the line. And uh, I mean, one, we became friends from my working on the Green Lantern movie. But Jeff, not only supporting the line and supporting the work I did, he also did an awesome thing by naming a Red Lantern character after me that the Four Horsemen created, which was the character Nightlick, N-I-T-L-I-K, which is how you pronounce my last name, my last name being spelled very differently. So, um, yeah, it was awesome. When we did this character, he walked into a conference room and was like, we're naming that character Nightlick. And I was like, okay, you said that, not me, because um, I knew what the fans were going to think. But that was really kind of him. He knew how hard I worked on this line. So I wanted to thank him by making sure to get Stargirl in there. And this is because Stargirl, some people may know, some people may not, uh, she's named after Jeff's sister, who unfortunately passed away. She was on Flight 800, TWA Flight 800, um, which which uh, didn't, didn't make it. And unfortunately she passed, but uh, Jeff absolutely loved his sister, so he named Stargirl Courtney after his sister. So very special character to him, and I wanted to make sure we got her in the line specifically for that. So, And he really thanked me for it. All right, so this leg that we're looking at as we creep up, of course, is because we're also talking about the final figure in the wave, which is the Build-A-Figure, I'm sorry, Collect and Connect figure, which was uh, Stargirl's partner, Stripe. Now, a lot of different versions of Stripe over the years. He was a robot, so kind of like, Iron, well, not a robot, he's a mech. There's a guy inside, kind of like Iron Man. Uh, more like Iron Monger, I guess, because like he's bigger than a person. The, the person's like driving inside of the, 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 the stomach area, I guess. And he has had a lot of looks over the years, much like Iron Man, you know, the armor, or in this case, the robot suit, or armor suit. I don't even know what you define it as, but it changes a lot, especially depending on which artist is doing it. 
here you can see how the driver fits inside. So, you know, it opens up and he can climb inside and there's a seat and he drives around much like uh, Iron Monger in the first Iron Man movie is kind of how to picture it. And we did talk about finding a way to have it open up and have the pilot figure inside, but that was just going to be way too expensive for a Build-A-Figure. He did appear in the JLU animated series, too, and we did a great one with a removable helmet. And he also appeared in the live action, although looks a lot like the Iron Giant here, which, again, I'm a huge fan of the Iron Giant, so I never mind when figures kind of borrow that look. As far as a Build-A-Figure, he stood pretty tall, as tall as some of the bigger Build-A-Figures we did. Not every character was, uh, you know, the Gorilla Grodd was a little bit shorter, but a little bit fatter, I guess, if you will. And the detail was incredible. Now, originally, we had slotted Stripe to be a fully tooled figure, and we gave the Horseman full reign to sculpt up a brand new robot suit, because, you know, we didn't really have a giant mech robot. But being the clever, amazing guys they are, they were like, well, you know, we do have another giant robot Build-A-Figure in Stealth, the Green Lantern character that we did a few waves ago. So, again, this is why the Horsemen are the amazing, amazing design partners that they are. They were able to modify Stell with new overlays on the chest and shoulder pads, which is like an add-on piece, a new head and new overlays on the arm gauntlets to make a new figure. And that is why they are awesome. And I love having these two figures on my shelf. I actually have them fighting like Rock'em Sock'em robots because, you know, this was kind of my version of Rock'em Sock'em robots from working on the line. I love robots. And I love the whole line. We did so many amazing figures. Thank you to uh, Foosh for putting this image together. They do a great job with that. Foosh.net.com? I have to check. I'm butchering it, aren't I? Sorry, Nick. And, uh, yeah, looking back, we did an amazing, amazing job as a team. The designers, the horsemen, the, the, the package designers. I am just so, so proud to have been part of the team that brought this collection to fans. It was an amazing, amazing experience. And it was going to continue as the signature series online for a little bit. But this was the retail line. It was a great time, and I'm glad to have you along for the ride.